Hello, and good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. Thanks for joining the fifth installment of the ANA Avatar X Prize Meet the Teams interview series. Today, we're here with Team Northeastern and several of their team members. This is going to be a really interesting session, so we are glad you took the time to join us. Uh, my name is Colin Peartree. I'm the team coordinator for the ANA Avatar X Prize. I'm also joined by my colleague and technical consultant, Jackie Mori. And we are here once again with Team Northeastern. There are six members of this team joining us today, and they have a lot of great, interesting information and content to share with us today. And so we are very excited to move forward. Before we begin, just a few notes about this webinar. Um, you will all be muted during the call, but you're welcome to use the chat function at the bottom of your screen to get in touch with us or to say hello to the others on the call. We also invite you throughout the session to submit questions that you have for Team Northeastern uh, into the Q&A function. We'll take some time at the end of the call to uh, add those to our discussion. So we invite you to present any questions to us and we'd be happy to, to take a look at them. A quick uh, overview of our agenda today, we're going to say hello and welcome to you and also to Team Northeastern. I'll be passing it over to the director of the Institute of Experiential Robotics at Northeastern in just a moment. And as I mentioned, we'll take some time at the end of the call to do some questions and discussions with this team. So be sure to submit once again, those questions. So once again, we're joined today by several members of a university-based team in Boston, Massachusetts from, team, or from Northeastern University. The members of this team on the call are decidedly multidisciplinary in their work and studies, and that leads to a highly dynamic approach to their avatar system which you're about to hear more. We're going to be viewing some presentations from these team members. Uh, so be sure to, once again, submit your questions. We'd love to have those questions from you as discussion points. Um, and we'll make time throughout the session to address those. To begin, to begin I'm really excited to introduce uh, Tashkin Pudir, who is the director of the Institute for Experiential Robotics at Northeastern University. And he is the leader of the Avatar XPRIZE team in Northeastern. Tashkin, welcome. It's a pleasure to have you here and the rest of your team. Please take it away. Um, Sounds good. Sounds good, Colin. Thank you so much for the introduction. Uh, and, um, you know, hello, everybody, and welcome to this, this session. Um, <clears throat> so um, I will share my slides and then I'll try to give you an idea about what we are trying to do and why. Uh, so let me start with the, uh, with the presentation. Um, so. What keeps you going? You know, why Avatar? Why did we decide to participate in this? So sometimes it helps us to reflect back in time and see what the technology achieved, right? So these are the early uh, attempts to fly, a technology that we take it granted these days, but it all started with failures. It all started with exploration. It all started with trying to push the limit, trying to push the envelope towards something that hasn't been done before. So with this in mind, um, you know, those videos are long videos, uh, but you know, I'll just uh, keep scrolling. I want to take you to five years ago when we worked on the DARPA Robotics Challenge. So these are uh, robots um, embracing the risks, right? So trying to achieve things that haven't been done before. And you know, every single team on the field experienced one failure or another. Uh, this is one of the famous videos of the DRC. Again, you can, you can find it on YouTube. Um, now, we take flight granted, and uh, you saw some of the grandfathers of the Atlas robot from Boston Dynamics on the previous video. And now this is where the technology is, right? So for those of you who think that, well, we, robots will never get there, or for those of you who think that you know, technology will not get there, I think we are making as a community great, great uh, uh, progress. So now what is um, in, our, uh, in our inventory in terms of projects that, that uh, we, uh, we worked on and why are we doing the um, uh, Avatar X Prize challenge? So this is a quick time travel. This is uh, exactly the team that I worked on um, uh, in 2015. And this was an avatar. Uh, this was the DARPA Robotics Challenge uh, to, to address the disaster response scenarios. Uh, actually, what you see is a robot doing a number of tasks. You know, it just drove this vehicle. It's going to open the, open the door, go through the door. Again, a disaster response inspired by Fukushima. But what you don't see is a 20, 30 people team that's 1,000 feet away, sitting in a garage, not seeing what the robot does, but seeing 
seeing through the eyes of the robot and trying to complete these tasks. So these robots were not fully autonomous. They were called um, uh, supervised autonomy, you know, supervised by human operators. But then we started pushing the limits of task completion when it comes to uh, robots that are complex in shape and form um, and enabling the operators to, to operate these systems to complete hard tasks, such as, you know, picking up a drill, uh, turning it, uh, turning it on, and and running it. You know, I was the um, uh, one of the team leads for the team WPI's TMU, and we did fairly well uh, in that competition. But aside from that, you know, here are some of the visuals, right? So a complex robot, a, a team of people who look at the robot on the field, but then another team that is really controlling the robot behind the scenes uh, and in interpreting the data and understanding what happens. Now, how do we change that paradigm? Uh, you know, through the Avatar X Prize, and how can we achieve that? You know, many to one to perhaps one to one, right? So, um, I will talk about some of the lessons learned uh, from the DRC. Even though it is five years ago, it is still pushing us to to in our research, in our study. We truly believe in maximizing the utility of the human and the robot team, human and the machine team, and and achieving these um, complex tasks. Um, making robots of all sorts and forms um, a, a, an avatar for the human capabilities. Oh boy, uh, did this become important in the past uh, six, seven months, right? So how many times did you think, I wish I had a robot avatar that can do my job uh, somewhere uh, far away uh, from, uh, from where I'm located? Uh, so here are some of the visuals from the challenge again, just to give you an idea where we were, and because I want to talk about some of the things what we are, you know, um, there's no way that a, a, an untrained operator can operate a humanoid robot by looking at these, uh, these screens. You, know, you need to train your operators, definitely. So what is the secret sauce? sauce? What did we do? Um, we looked at the tasks very carefully during the challenge. You know, they were defined, but then there were a lot of variabilities as well, right? Uncertainties, variabilities. Right? So you cannot plan everything and say that, okay, so the humans will be able to control these systems from end to end. For a human or robot like this, you get a first plan out, okay, it's just simply opening the door task. It is very intuitive for a human, but how will you do it with your avatar? Um, you have to plan it out, you have to reach, you have to turn it on and you have to factor your tasks. And then this factorization is critical because it enables human robot teaming, right? So where do you want your operator input to come into picture? And what does the robot can, what does the robot do uh, autonomously, right? So uh, one of um, our, um, our uh, key contributions here or, or your key, key uh, success stories here was uh, the, the behaviors of nudging. Right, so when the robot thought, okay, here's where I'm gonna put my hand to engage the door handle, uh, we allow the operator to be able to nudge that decision because there's always that deeper human intuition where we think, oh, wait a minute, you won't be able to grab that handle because you're way too, too off you know, from the center and things like that, right? So this is, this is where we were building and uh, that, that enabled us to, to formulate complex uh, models of computation for, um, uh, for task completion. Um, again, you know, perception will be a key aspect because we will split at the end of the day, we will split the autonomy of the robot uh, with the supervision of the human operator to achieve the true um, uh, promise of the, of the avatar technology. Um, and again, that's a step-by-step -step, uh, process. Uh, manipulation, uh, and, and, and motion planning, motion and task planning has been a huge focus of, um, uh, of our, our teams. Um, and what we can do is we can, uh, we can um, generate multiple tasks, uh, multiple solutions to, to perform the same task using a complex system. Now, very briefly, what did we learn, right? So, I mean, I think the capabilities make sense, but what was really critical um, as an outcome of the DARPA Robotics Challenge Reliable hardware is critical. You cannot just put everything on, on the software side and hope that the you know, hardware will operate. You have to have a strong hardware um, design and, and creation. Reliable software is critical. You know, those videos, those pictures have stories behind them, right? So for example, here, we dropped the drill during the, during the day one tasks because a one-off software bug 
uh, triggered and the robot just opened its hand when it was, it was holding the drug. So reliable software is critical. This is, I think, one of the most important um, aspects from, from my perspective for the challenge, for the Avatar X Prize challenge. We need to validate uh, robot or the avatar behaviors. And then at the end of the day, we are aiming to maximize the utility of the human robot team. This is essential. Um, a, a human understanding the capabilities and limitations of the robot avatar um, is important. And this is where we are aiming towards. And that this is how we will, we, we think that we'll be able to complete the, um, uh, the tasks or the scenarios that are outlined in the, in the challenge. Uh, and a rigorous validation strategy is critical. Uh, you know, even though I said, you know, we are trying to lower the barriers to operator training, you know, it's, it's always um, difficult, especially if your avatar is a complex system, such as a, such as a, um, humanoid robot. And then a, a capability from the avatar side on understanding the uh, errors based on uncertainties, based on the limitations of the technology to understanding, understanding the source of errors is critical. So this was a quick wrap on what we have done for the DRC uh, five years ago, but then what have we been doing since then? Um, you know, we've been working with uh, NASA's humanoid robot technology, uh, Valkyrie, um, and uh, basically moving more and more autonomous behaviors to the, to the robot side to achieve more complex tasks. So this is still uh, you know, a couple of years uh, old, old uh, results where we were able to autonomously, you know, the human just says, go and pick up the box and then deliver, right? So uh, this is a very intuitive way of, you know, that, that supervision, uh, human supervision. And then we have a whole uh, line of aut autonomous behaviors where the robot can navigate through tight corners, uh, understand you know, what to pick up and what to do with the object and, and so on. Um, again, all these videos are available, will be available later on. And then you know, more complex manipulation tasks as well. Right? So how do you turn a, turn a uh, valve to be able to adjust you know, antennas and, and things like that? Uh, Valkyrie is a complex system, uh, so it is not really intuitive for a human to, to, um, to control it, you know, joint by joint, so it needs to be at a supervisory level. But this is um, much more recent work uh, where we simplified, if you just remember, although I very briefly, very quickly went through it, if you remember our DRC interface, it was much more complex, so now we can put a lot of things behind the scenes and then you know, we can even add the autonomy uh, at the interfaces level. So we have a much simpler user interface if it's just 2D, you know, keyboard mouse type of an interface. Oh, by the way, you know, with the emergence of the virtual reality interfaces, now we can do even better. We can uh, allow the operator to pick up, you know, okay, so you want this robot to walk, right? So robot can, Plan out, plan out its steps, and then all what remains to the operator or the or the human uh, on you know far away is to validate that plan and say go and execute or you know reaching right. So if you want to, you know, uh, it's interesting when you start controlling a humanoid robot. You know things are are really complex, right? So do you reach with the right arm or do you reach with the left arm, right? So we can leave these decisions selectively to the human operator, uh, and these are just some of the uh, uh, results that we. Um, recently um, obtained. And then here's another, uh, another um, idea, although this is a little bit far away from the concept of the avatar, but this shows us how we use the virtual reality tools to achieve this, this transparency in the human robot collaboration. And I think it will be another key cap capability for, uh, for the avatar challenge. How does the robot understand what the human is going to do versus how does the human understand what the robot actions are, right? So it's easier said than done when I said that we put more autonomy on the robot, but then whenever you have human in the loop, if the human doesn't have an idea about what the robot is doing, that doesn't become a true team uh, arrangement in my opinion, in our opinion. So we are trying to push the limits on that front. This wraps up my quick overview of, you know, um, uh, specifically what I do in my lab and, and you know, what some of the visions that we have for, uh, for our team's participation in the Avatar X Prize. Next, next I'm gonna pass on the baton to uh, 
Professor Peter Whitney, and he will talk about what um, he works on and, and uh, some of the hardware technologies that we are developing. Peter? Thank you, Tashkin. I'm uh, sharing my screen now. So, uh, so Tashkin uh, took us through a, a, a big picture of all the pieces that we need to be successful in the Avatar Challenge. And my focus um, and, and one of the critical things that, that uh, Tashkin pointed to is reliable hardware. Um, so I'm gonna talk about some of the research I've done in the past and how we're gonna bring some of those elements in, in particular for um, hand design and tactile interaction. Um, and after my presentation, I'll pass it off. Um, we have some student groups that are, are working uh, more on the human machine interface side. So exoskeleton design um, and, uh, and, and bringing some of these elements all together. All right, uh, just a second. So actually, before I came to Northeastern, um, I, I actually worked for Disney. And this is a project uh, some of you might be familiar with. Uh, this is actually um, an avatar system uh, named Jimmy. And uh, we, developed the, we developed this system to create um, physically interactive experiences via robots for guests in Disney theme parks. So that's actually uh, me behind the scenes. Um, behind the wall, uh, teleoperating Jimmy. And I'll, I'll speak in a second about some of the, the technology behind the scenes. Um, we looked at a, a couple different approaches. Uh, this is some, some older work using uh, pneumatic transmissions to, uh, to generate very smooth, uh, lightweight robot arm motion. And in the rest of the video, uh, Jimmy is driven through a, uh, a water-based hydraulic transmission. So highlighting some of the uh, some of the, the features and capabilities of this kind of a system. So this is uh, teleoperated needle threading. Where are my cheeks? And of course, if, if you're going to build human safe robots, um, I, I feel like you have to test it on your own children. Um, Want to, if you want to show people what uh, what it's really capable of by Jimmy. Um, so in this clip, actually, there was a, a brief second where it shows behind the scenes what's going on here. There's actually two identical robots, um, but they're not electrically coupled through motors. They're actually physically coupled through um, a hydrostatic transmission. And the, the, the concept is not unlike uh, what some of you might have seen. This is a kind of a popular um, educational exercise for students. Uh, you, you take some syringes and connect them and fill them with water and you create a sort of manual remote transmission. Um, and so so this concept uh, took this concept in and uh, improved it in several areas. So one thing, uh, you have a lot of, of friction in the seals of this uh, sort of a hydrostatic transmission. So we use uh, special uh, nearly zero um, static friction rolling diaphragms. It's um, sort of a, a soft fiber reinforced element. And, and it gives us a, a nearly frictionless ability to transmit force and motion. And one thing that's, that's not obvious in that, that um, Disney video is the operator can actually feel what's going on. So picking up that egg and moving it, um, the, you, know, you, you don't stumble and drop it because you actually can feel contact. Um, so it's, it's kind of hard to, uh, to demonstrate to you the sense of touch in a video, um, but we'll, we'll come back to that in a later slide. So uh, what we've just seen is basically the sort of passive teleoperation. Uh, and of course, if you've got hoses connected, you can only go a few tens of meters um, before the, you know, the, the friction in the, uh, in the fluid lines becomes too much. And, uh, and, and so obviously, you know, we can't stretch um, hydraulic hoses across the country um, uh, or, or over long distances. So instead, what we can do is we can use this, this similar uh, kind of transmission to build a, a motorized arm. Um, and so here for an avatar, you'd actually have two copies. So we have a, a, a motorized avatar, and then we would have a motorized haptic interface. So Tauschkin talked a lot about uh, shared autonomy. And, and what I'm presenting about is direct haptic um, telemanipulation or, or teleoperation. So again, for the avatar system, we would have um, 
two of these uh, two of these systems, and they would be coupled electrically over arbitrary distances. Um, the, the the video from Disney we used um, rotary actuators for all of the joints, um, but in uh, in recent work here at Northeastern, we've developed these um, ultra low friction uh, linear motion actuators. Um, and, and maybe I skipped over it, but you might be wondering, well, why do we need these hydrostatic actuators that are driven by, by motors? Why not just use motors directly? And the main reason is, is that if we want uh, many actuated degrees of freedom, if we have to put motors at all of these joints, it makes the arms incredibly heavy. Um, and, and so heavy arms can be dangerous. It, it, it sort of filters out and blunts your sense of touch. Um, so by using this transmission, we're able to take every single motor out of the hands, out of the arms, and men, mount all of those motors remotely. Um, so here, this, uh, this actuator can actually push with up to 100 pounds of force, um, but it only weighs 70 grams itself. So we can take a, a couple of these and uh, build a two degree of freedom uh, gripper. So we have a sort of wrist flexion extension motion and then a, a, a grasping motion. Um, and so to, to operate this, uh, we have two motors you can see at the top. Uh, these are direct drive brushless motors and they're remotely operating this, this gripper here. And so you can see teleoperating, we can get very, very fast, very, very smooth motion. Um, we can also, uh, yeah, the, the system is, is very easily back drivable. This is showing actually measuring the pressure in the hydraulic lines. So it's incredibly, it's, the sense of touch is, is in, incredibly sensitive. This is a, a simple, uh, this is a five degree of freedom system uh, doing some simple tele operation. Oh, this is kind of interesting. This is showing um, squeezing uh, different bits of foam. The traces above, you can see in, in, uh, in orange, that's actually the force that we're measuring. So that memory foam has sort of a, a relaxation property. We actually had a, a, a project to do uh, seafood handling. So being able to pick up seafood and actually uh, you know, sense the mechanical properties um, of, of the fillet there. This is the, the students having some fun with, uh, <laughs> with, uh, with uh, high speed uh, seafood, uh, seafood processing. Um, this is a slide from a, a related project that we have actually on doing underwater um, avatar type telemanipulation for explosive ordnance disposal tasks. Um, so this is, is kind of highlighting the, uh, the, 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 the fully haptic telemanipulation strategy. So you'd have two duplicate arms. Um, and here we're showing just with sort of a, a glove gripper interface. So there's a duplicate gripper that's actually allowing force coupling between the avatar and the operator. So they're getting a fine sense of touch um, at the gripper. Um, later, Carl is gonna talk about some efforts to actually build a, a, a full um, exoskeleton system. Um, yeah, but, but before I before I hand it off, I, I want to talk a little bit about um, uh, sort of a connection that I have to Avatar that that's sort of interesting is, um, you know, when you think about about Avatar and everything you, you'd want it to do and all the sort of tasks that you'd want to do, um, I've I've had sort of similar ideas about you know what would be the ultimate task, what would be the hardest task um, that we could ask a robot to do. So this is um, Baxter. Some of you might be familiar. Uh, it's a series elastic actuated. Um, robot that was um, built by Rethink Robotics. Um, it's uh, it's not incredibly accurate, but it does have more um, compliance and force sensitivity. But my question to you is, would you be willing to take a Baxter and uh, give him a straight razor and then have Baxter uh, shave you with a straight razor? Uh, maybe in, in the time of COVID, this is, is not so extraordinary uh, a concept. But um, if you think actually about the, the task of shaving, you know, if, if, we, if we take a straight razor and we think about, well, not only do we need to be able to control the position of the blade as you're trying to shave someone's face, um, but you need to be able to control the contact forces. And then you also, for example, need maybe a reflex motion. So if you notice that there is some kind of a slicing motion, um, you can quickly, quickly pull out of the way. Um, and, and of course, this kind of task can't be executed if there isn't a sense of touch. Um, so we got the idea, um, not, not with a fully autonomous system yet, but could we actually take on straight razor shaving with, the, with this um, hydrostatic transmission technology? Um, and so, uh, so we actually recently uh, did a test here. So this is um, a little more. 
So this is actually a three degree of freedom, uh, Jimmy style manipulator. That angle's good. Great. Now okay. just keep trying to keep your head in that same angle. Okay. All right. So when we're going to put the razor on. Yeah. Stretch your skin nice right. and tight. From here? Yeah. Okay. And then I'll come straight down on that side. Okay. So um, j just a, a, yeah. a point to note out here is oh, uh, okay. this is a friend of mine who is a professional barber um, that's actually going to shave me with the, the straight razor here. So there's no motors involved in, in this case. This is just, a, again, the, the passive um, uh, direct physical manipulation. Lean your head over to your left a little more. The idea here is that, is that he has more. a very fine sense of touch. He could feel right. the blade sliding along my face and cutting. Move your head a little more to your left. Oh, it feels good. How does it feel? Feels pretty good. Does it feel like it's uh, slippery enough? It's not. You? It's not too sticky. Not too sticky. So yeah, this was kind of a pre-avatar challenge. Um, for myself thinking about you know an ultimate an ultimate test that that really um it's getting more and more natural <laughs> yeah <sighs> so we can do it yeah, it really it really captures the the challenges of robotics and and really kind of um brings right to your to your um to your mind you know what are the weaknesses and what are the limitations and if you think about that task and you think about handing it over to a robot um I think it helps identify areas that um, that need improvement. Uh, so yeah, I just I briefly want to mention some uh, sponsors that have, have uh, funded this work. Um, some of this uh, is uh, co-work uh, with Tauschkin and also um, wanted to mention some graduate students and collaborators that have um, participated in this work. Um, so thank you. Um, I'm going to hand it over to Carl Swanson. Carl is one of many uh, undergraduate students that are working on several different projects. Um, to kind of piece together different elements of technology um, with a primary focus on uh, human machine interface. So uh, thank you and I'll hand it over to Carl. Thank you, Professor Whitney. All right, I'm gonna start sharing my screen then. All right, so now as a team, we're gonna give a brief overview of the system that we're developing now. My name is Carl Swanson. I am a senior at Northeastern University, currently pursuing a combined degree in computer engineering, and computer science. Outside of classes, I've spent a lot of time within Northeastern's aerospace organization, working on um, anything from drones to avionics bays um, to NASA student launch, which is a competition involving rovers and uh, drones as well. So in a project lead role, I've worked within Northeastern's NUAV group, which is a Northeastern unmanned aerial vehicle working on companion computing between drones where multiple drones um, work together to accomplish various tasks. On co-op, I've worked as a software engineer or co-op at um, iRobot working on their new Terra lawnmower. Then I worked uh, at Square Robot working on an AUV, autonomous underwater vehicle that went into oil tanks to inspect them for damage using various sensors. And then I'm currently working at Amazon Robotics on other things. Growing up reading uh, Asimov, my interest in robotics rely in removing humans from dangerous situations and additionally giving them time back into their lives. And so the Avatar project really presents like the perfect mixture of that. I mean, so we, this project, the, the Avatar system can remove a human from a dangerous situation for like Fukushima, something like that, a power plant. Um, if someone has to work in outer space, like an astronaut inside the space station needs to very carefully manipulate something to fix a, a satellite. Same thing there, it can work there, but it can also allow us to get more time back into our lives. Like Professor Padir mentioned earlier, removing a human from like a workplace when they don't necessarily have to be there. And now Anya will give her a, I'll lead over to her. Yes, I am Anya Derrick. I am a fourth year electrical engineering student at Northeastern University. Uh, outside of class, I've done two co-ops. My first one being at Teradyne um, in the semiconductor industry 
and right now I'm at Lutron Electronics doing design and development. Um, my interests are mainly in PCB design, so that's why I joined this project. Uh, and then outside of class, I typically uh, volunteer for STEM mentoring and teaching, as well as some side research projects related to corporate response to social movements. And the rest of the EE team uh, consists of Shay and Peter. So Shay is, oh, okay. Uh, Shay is um, a fifth year electrical and computer engineering student. Uh, Shay co is currently on co-op at Draper Labs, but she has also done co-ops at Boston Engineering and Arkstone in Singapore. And Shane's interests are mainly in electronics as well as wireless capabilities. Uh, which is why she decided to join this project. And Peter downward, Peter is currently in Greece, so he couldn't join us. Uh, Peter is uh, a fifth year electrical engineering student. He's done two co-ops as well. His interests are mostly in the mix between electrical and mechanical systems. So he's done a co-op at Electric GT, as well as uh, Professor Padir's uh, robotics lab, where he worked on a five degree of freedom robotic arm. And he is also very much interested in sustainability in the technology sector and kind of integrating that with mechanical and electrical design. And then additionally, on the software side, we have Peter Albanese and Spencer Sochin. Peter has a bunch of experience with embedded robotics, both at the university and on co-op. On co-op, he's worked at Kinetic North America and MKS Instruments, and is currently working on um, some research with machine learning and artificial intelligence at the Northeastern Burlington campus, uh, the Calsis Research Institute. He's very excited to work on this system that's going to include haptics and really work on providing like biomedic motion to the human user. And he's excited to create new software solution for a project that is really cutting edge and hasn't been seen before. Spencer additionally has a lot of experience with embedded firmware development and electrical engineering. On co-op, he worked at Analog Devices, MKS Instruments, and then currently Amazon Robotics. And he has a specialized interest in real-time operating systems which will be extremely useful for us when we move into that on the system itself, and is interested in low-level communication protocols like SPY and things like that. And now we'll lead off into the uh, Meki team. Hi, my name is Mike Polkari. I'm just going to introduce myself and the uh, four other members that are uh, of the mechanical end of things. So like I said, my name is Mike Polkari. I'm a candidate for a Bachelor's of Science in Mechanical Engineering, and it's my senior year at Northeastern. Uh, I've been lucky to have two vastly different co-op experiences at Northeastern. Uh, my first was with A123 Systems, where I got to work in process engineering. Uh, we mainly worked in streamlining the manufacturing process for electrodes in electric car batteries. Uh, right now, I'm working at Viking Detection um, in a mechanical design role, aiding with the design of an under-vehicle x-ray system that's designed for law enforcement. Uh, for me personally, I love being an engineer because engineering bridges the gap between science and creativity. And uh, now it has the potential to bridge the gap between technology and the human experience. And so being part of Northeastern's avatar team is a once in a lifetime chance to do that. Uh, I'm going to hand it over to my friend Al to introduce himself real quick. Hey, uh, I'm Albert Saunders. I'm a fifth year uh, mechanical engineering major at Northeastern University uh, with minors in material science and mathematics. I've had uh, three co-op experiences so far. My first two in the biomedical device sector where I worked at Diffuse Synthes. Um, on the shoulder reconstruction team, uh, a similar role at Spawn Frontier on the spine implant team, and right now at Amazon Robotics. Um, I also work part-time on the information technology team for the Boston Red Sox at Fenway Park. Um, and I'm hoping to use uh, the great knowledge that I've gathered uh, in classes and in on co-op in uh, robotics, shoulder biomechanics, and material science to inform our team decisions on mechanical design and biomimicry. Um, I got into engineering for a very simple reason. Uh, I just want to help people using science and technology. And I feel like at this particular point in human history, the avatar competition presents itself um, at a great time. You know, remote telepresence is becoming more and more uh, impactful and necessary. And I feel like uh, getting on this project at this point in time um, is very fulfilling to me. And I hope to help as much as I can. Real excited to work on this. So to introduce the rest of the mechanical engineering team that couldn't be here today, um, we have Albert Demers, who is a senior mechanical engineering major um, with a minor in robotics. He enjoys volunteering through Northeastern's outreach program to teach robotics to elementary school children. 
He has held uh, electromechanical positions at Stone Ridge, Instron, and Raytheon, and he hopes to utilize his knowledge of robotics to achieve effective telepresence. We also have Sapir Kansalar, who is a combined BS, MS uh, in mechanical engineering major. Um, he is a former product design development engineering co-op at Procter & Gamble. He, uh, we're very lucky to have his experience in design for manufacturability, injection molding, um, mold design, and the like. Uh, not only that, he is also professionally certified in SolidWorks, and he enjoys studying a variety of robotics topics. And I'll hand it back over to Mike to introduce John Corey. Thanks, Al. Uh, last but not least, we have John Corey. Uh, John is a senior mechanical engineering major here at Northeastern with a minor in mathematics. Uh, he's also the co-founder and lead project manager at Northeastern's VR club. Uh, currently, he's working at FLIR Unmanned Ground Systems in an R&D position. In addition to all this, he's also a self-made entrepreneur with a number of patents pending on various products, and he's excited to apply his robotics and VR skill sets towards making emotive and expressive telepresencing possible. So the, uh, the current avatar system was designed with a few high-level design requirements in mind. Uh, the team desired a wearable electric exoskeleton driving a robotic arm with five degrees of freedom, a three kilogram maximum load at the end effector, and a 0.5 meters per second maximum end effector speed. Uh, the team wanted to focus on biomimicry first to really effectively communicate um, the human presence from uh, one spot to a remote location, uh, while maximizing the positional accuracy of the end effector, um, kind of like what Professor Whitney was talking about earlier to improve safety and allow it to be used around humans. So with those requirements in mind, the current exoskeleton design has four degrees of freedom, three at the shoulder and one at the elbow. Uh, the components are 3D printed to minimize the weight to about seven pounds. All of the joints are directly driven to eliminate backlash and the shoulder joint has three axes of rotation that intersect at one point. And that back plate is fixed behind the user for usability and comfortability. Uh, straps comfortably fix the exoskeleton to the operator's arm for effective motion. And coming over to the robotic arm design, it currently has five degrees of freedom, three degrees at the shoulder, one degree at the elbow, and one degree at the wrist for pronation and supination. Um, this has brought the total weight down to about 15 pounds, total actuated weight, um, due in part by the spanners that are single 30 millimeter carbon fiber tube, uh, which offer us high stiffness at a low weight. Um, and we utilize 3D printed bonding coupling ends for ideal torque transfer. I'm going to pass it back over to Mike to talk about differentials and get into more of the nitty gritty of our design. Okay, so with specific regard to the robotic arm, it is comprised of three main sub assemblies. They are two identical differentials and one shoulder rocker. Uh, the differential itself was designed with modularity and ease of iteration differential to mimic either the shoulder or the elbow and to be swapped freely if necessary. Um, each differential is comprised of four sub-assemblies that you can see here. Uh, they are the motor housing, two identical timing belt transmissions, and a bevel gear drive. Um, this design grants that differential two degrees of freedom. Uh, they're mainly made of 3D printed plastic, but critical components are made of steel, such as the gears, and the overall weight is approximately four and a half pounds. Uh, similarly, the shoulder rocker is an additional motor subassembly that is only present at the shoulder of the robotic arm. Um, this rocker grants the shoulder one additional degree of freedom to fully mimic the functionality of the human shoulder and has identical belt transmission to that of the differential and is made of a single piece of 3D printed plastic. Um, additionally, this is mounted at a 30 degree angle to uh, biomimetically match the human shoulder and make that transition more intuitive. Another thing we've been working on is a virtual reality operator inter interface. And uh, essentially, this would allow the user to take in visual data through the use of a VR headset, letting them look around the room. Uh, it mirrors the roll, pitch, and yaw of the head and allows the user to convey subtle body language. Uh, I will let the video speak for itself. It's presented by our teammate, John Corey. The avatar camera system is able to copy the roll, pitch, and yaw of the operator by converting the gyroscope data from the VR headset into motor commands. This not only allows for real-time visual feedback, but also helps give the avatar personality by depicting the subtle head movements of the operator. This feature, in addition to others incorporated throughout the system, bring us closer to achieving the desired simulation of the user's persona at the point of the avatar, or sans icon. Thanks, guys. All right, now we're going to go into a little bit more of detail on how our software stack is going to work. 
So on the software side, we're going to be employing ROS as a robotics middleware. ROS is going to handle much of the uh, heavy lifting, including the physical simulation, motion planning, and importantly, the message passing between applications on our arm. Following our uh, preliminary research, we're going to be using ROS Control, which is a common ROS package to tie together our simulation and hardware. This is going to allow us to run hardware and loop testing, permitting us to visualize how our arm is moving, not only in the real world, but also in software. So as I mentioned before, we're leveraging ROS Control to provide this interface between the simulated real life and or simulated and real life environment. It also gives us the ability to tune uh, easily the PID loops for our system and gives us the ability to send simple effort commands to our arms joints, which then are seamlessly translated into electrical signals sent to our O-Drive boards. ROS is going to assist in creating a software structure where each one of our nodes can easily access information from all the other nodes on our system. In such a complex system, simulation is more important than ever. By simulating our robotic arm, bugs that may cause our arm to physically break in the real world will instead, leave, will instead just simply fail in the simulation. It's a lot easier to fix problems that are like a simple line of code rather than buying more parts, spending money, and reordering broken materials. To simulate the motion of our arm, we're going to be using Gazebo here. It's a real-time physics simulation that hooks into ROS, and by using an accurate model of our arm with mass distributed correctly across the model, we will additionally be able to simulate PID tuning in software. Using Gazebo has additional benefits as it's going to allow us to visualize the requested and actual position of the robotics arm as it com is commanded by the exoskeleton. All right, at this point, I'd like to go through and run a demo. So I'm gonna switch over to my phone. One moment, that'll take me just five seconds here. All right, can everyone see me there? Good. Yep, good. Yeah. Right. Sure. yeah. So as you can see, our system is here. We have the uh, whole system within with the strap for the user to go in. It's currently powered by a power supply that we sal I salvaged off the previous project. Unfortunately, um, due to COVID, we were forced to split up some of the uh, project parts between different members so I could work on it. So currently, we only have the exoskeleton here while the uh, the robotic car itself is in another location. Currently, for this uh, demonstration, I'm going to be showing driving a single motor and then reading the encoder positions off of two of these um, motors right there. Let's set that up real quick. All right. So it's fairly easy for the user to uh, strap in. So let's just mount this right above the elbow. Connect it down there. And then if you watch my arm here, I am mirroring the movement off of this single joint onto that joint over there onto that single O-drive powering that motor. It mirrors it quite well. So if I even like make my new change like one degree, it's extremely responsive and this will allow the user to perform very um, delicate tasks and in general, allowed to act like a human would in normal situation. Now while I'm uh, working with this, Anya is gonna give a couple uh, just details on how we chose encoders for our system and the power systems in general. Yeah, so as you can probably see hanging off the side there, uh, we are currently at the moment using O-Drives to uh, control our motors. Uh, O-Drives are open source and affordable, so they gave us the flexibility we needed in times of COVID to quickly and rapidly just integrate everything. Uh, we did create our own um, encoder PCBs that are mounted. There, there are slots inside the exoskeleton where the encoder PCBs are mounted, and we specifically picked on-axis magnetic position sensors to do our encoding, um, specifically the AS. Uh, 5047P because it's high precision, high speed, it has 14 bit core resolution. So it really gave us um, what we needed in terms of um, having precise motion and being able to mirror it. Uh, at the moment, we're using SPI as our communication protocol for the encoders, but um, we did pick an encoder that does have uh, options for both absolute and incremental positioning. So we can, in the future, uh, potentially add that. Uh, to our system. And then we do also plan on developing custom controllers in addition to the O-Drives uh, just to give us more flexibility in terms of 
uh, picking our communication protocol, although all, all drives did recently start supporting CAN communication, which is what we do plan on using. But having our own board will enable us to kind of integrate the controller part of our system with uh, the encoders and kind of have it all in one uh, single board with the communication protocol that we want. Uh, and it's sort of future proofing us in a way because if we end up uh, adding any functionalities to our boards in the future, um, it will be easy to just add that on instead of starting uh, from scratch pretty much. But yeah, uh, we are using uh, or planning on using STM32 microcontrollers for those boards, which are going to be modeled after the old drive, but uh, we're going to add our own layer to it. <laughs> To show another demo of how we're able to accurately read the uh, positional values from here. This one, this is from the uh, one of the shoulder joints and then the arm joint itself. I can move that one. It discreetly is up there, and it just shows how we can track individually each one of these joints as it moves to a relatively high degree of precision. That's it for the demo. I'm going to hop back on my normal computer, and we can go to any questions. Yeah, well, Carl hops back on. Um, this is definitely just the beginning stages of our project. We're definitely looking forward to integrating all of the work that Professor Padir and Pro Professor Whitney have been doing in their own labs and kind of putting it all together eventually. But COVID has definitely presented itself as a challenge in terms of uh, getting our team together and kind of starting to piece together um, our system. Wow, thank you very much for that demo and the walkthrough of your entire system. It was amazing to meet all of your team as well, uh, whether they were able to be here or if you were just showing their uh, their headshot on screen. Um, it's clear to me that, I, as I said before, that there really is a multidisciplinary approach to this team. Um, tons of knowledge base that's coming through from each of your team members. Um, so it's really impressive to see that, hear about it, and also really cool to just have, uh, despite the, the challenges that were presented by current state of affairs in this world, um, just having that in literally your your backyard, your living room um, to, to work on that. Uh, pretty interesting, Carl, so thanks for showing that demo. Um, uh, anyone who's listening in in the audience, you're welcome to submit questions as we go through. Um, we're just gonna be doing a, a discussion for the next 10, 15 minutes or so, so we invite you to, uh, to write into us and um, pose questions to this team. I do want to hop back to um, maybe go through the, the beginning of the presentation. Peter, um, the way that you were using that system for not only Jimmy, but also the shaving experience, um, that's physical connection. Um, and it presents a really impressive level of dexterity and also um, compatibly mapping the motions of your, of your, uh, of yourself. Um, what kind of, um, or how similar can you get that sort of level of, I guess maybe fidelity is a good word, but um, quality of motion with a system that's teleoperated. There's a lot of fine motion that's happening in that one. What's what's the state of the art as far as what we can do with something that's farther away? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so I think the in the the video on the gripper, um, I showed the uh, th there was a teleoperation. Um, and then there was also uh, teleoperation and uh, scooping up uh, scooping up the fish. Um, so all of that teleoperation is just a positional command. So there, the the operator did not have a duplicate uh, gripper to serve as like a haptic glove. Um, and so that's actually work that um, that that's that's ongoing right now. So we're we're currently um, trying to design a a system to allow someone to wear a duplicate copy of the gripper um, mm -hmm. uh, so that the, so that we can have a, a basically a force reflection coupling um, between the gripper and the the avatar hand um, so in terms of the uh, the performance that could be achieved actually in the um, in the electrically coupled version you actually can get better performance than the uh, the direct uh, physical, teleoperation. And the reason is, is that, for example, when um, uh, uh, Jesse, the barber, was shaving me, um, he's manipulating one end, and that's going through uh, the transmission, and then through the hydraulic line, and then through another transmission actuator. So there's, there's, there's two actuators with the fluid in between. 
And so any amount of imperfection or friction in the actuators, um, you go through that twice. Mm -hmm. But in an autonomous system, if you can measure the pressure in the hydraulic line, um, that, that basically allows uh, a measurement of the, of the contact forces uh, where you can skip one of the actuators. So you actually, the, the measured pressure is better than the sense of touch that an operator would have in the passive system. Um, so that's, uh, yeah, that's, we have a, an area of research on uh, how do we make best use of um, measured forces um, and, and measured haptic information um, in the, in the uh, overall control loop, but um, yeah. Really interesting. I, I wouldn't almost wouldn't have expected that, but it makes sense that there's a lot of different hardware um, the things that it's moving through actually transmitting that signal, as it were, in a more physical sense um, versus just a single, more more simplistic, although seemingly complex channel. Yeah, if you if you remember the example with the um, the two uh, syringes, like yeah. the uh, the the school um, experiment, mm -hmm. you're pushing on a syringe and you feel the friction of that syringe mm -hmm. um, seal. And then the pressure in the high, in the the water line, and then it's pushing the second syringe. So yeah, you you feel it twice um, uh, in that case. Have you guys uh, decided what the actual form of the avatar robot will be yet? You've got all the parts going there. I just wondered what you're going to do for the final. I'll take this question on. How about that? <laughs> Good. Before <laughs> so, you have to... um, as, as 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 you mentioned, um, I we think that we have the foundational blocks to put it together, and uh, we've been waiting for the final scenarios to be announced so that we can analyze them and and mm -hmm. you know decide uh, where to go. And now that they are out uh, as of last month, um, you know, to to answer your question in short, no, we did not settle on. Okay, here it is. Yet, however, we have. I think in our inventory we have quite a few platforms that will serve well for the uh, for the announced scenarios for the semifinals. Uh, but then eventually, you know, we are converging as as the team mentioned on integrating all these different little pieces together uh, to have the whole system set up. Yeah, I think it's great that you're you're trying to put that human experience into the the whole robotic system, and I I love the little um, the demo you showed with the two eyes and and trying to get the persona of the operator in there, even with just two camera eyes. I think that you know you can do a lot, and it doesn't have to be you know fully formed humanoid robot. It can do um, as long as it can connect to two people together that that's what we're going for. That's why we are known as the Institute for Experiential Robotics to, <laughs> enrich, to enrich human robot experiences. Thanks, Tashkin. I just had a quick question coming through the Q&A from anonymous attendee. Um, and it's quick, why not full hydrostatic? I don't know who exactly to direct that question to, but anyone can feel free to dive in. Yeah, I, I can take that. Um, so that's, um, that's a great question. Um, I mean, we, we do have projects where we're envisioning building a, a fully hydrostatically actuated system. Um, sort of a trade-off between uh, complexity and performance. Um, and another way to think about it is that if you think about from your fingertip to your hand, to your wrist, to your elbow, to your shoulder, um, the, the closer you get up towards the body, up towards the shoulder, um, you know, the more you need your joints to be stronger and, and, and more pre precise. And the closer you get out towards the fingertips, um, the more you need the system to be able to behave compliantly and to, and to be able to measure forces. So out at the fingertips, out in the hand, um, the very low friction hydrostatic um, driven, remotely driven system, I think is definitely the best option. I mean, if you, if you tried to build a direct drive motorized gripper, uh, that's gonna be incredibly heavy to have those, um, those big motors out there um, where the mass penalty is, is the worst, um, you know, the farther away you are from, from the shoulder. So um, I, I, yeah, there's a, there's a range of solutions uh, which could involve, you know, maybe having hydrostatic hand and wrist um, and then having a, a, a more traditional motorized um, upper, upper body. Um, and uh, another thing is actually the, the exoskeleton design that we're working on. Um, it's actually fully motorized, 
but um, but each joint is direct drive, and it's and it's actually designed not to exert the full um, torque that the avatar is capable of. It it has a, a force scaling, um, mm -hmm. because what we found is for the human operator, they don't nest the 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 interaction forces, um, uh, you, you don't necessarily need to be able to feel the full magnitude of it, um, but it's, it's about changes in forces. You know, if you're touching something or if you're sliding along and you're feeling friction, it's those, it's those force vibrations that are really giving you that, um, that tactile and, and proprioceptive feedback. Um, so, yeah, so again, in, in, in terms of uh, making things uh, simpler, you know, not having motors and motor control and a hydrostatic transmission and all of the the complexity of that. I'm just having a simple lightweight electric system that's not capable of full strength, but it's capable of, of full haptic quality um, is the direction that we're, we're going towards. And so that system doesn't have a gripper at the end. And so the, that um, uh, is, is slated to be hydrostatically actuated. Yeah. Got it. Yeah, Carl or anybody, anything to add about the, the exoskeleton system itself and where things are going next as far as how you're developing it? next stages of testing, other things to, that are gonna be integrated with that? Yeah, so I think Professor Whitney just explained quite well there, the plans moving forward. I mean, this, it's a back drivable system, so the user can experience like haptics on it by himself. Mm -hmm. That is one of our next steps. Um, we've taken kind of like a complete 180 from our, our previous direction, which was a custom developed PCB using a, uh, a TI chip. And now we're moving on to using a more open source um, solution called O-Drive which is uh, one, of, one of our sponsors now as well. And it's an amazing, uh, so it's a single board that allows, it performs like all the PD tuning um, for your robotic system and allows you to very easily create a system that can be back driven. So we're currently using, you might've seen uh, the taped board onto the arm there that I was working with. That's our, our solution for now. It's gonna change very soon. So we have a mechanical mounting option. But what we're trying to do now is move that onto a footprint that can be put onto the back of the, um, the current motors we have. So currently we have these PCBs that Anya designed that only read off the encoder value and then report that back to the O-Drive. Once we can pull the chips off the O-Drive and make our own PCB, we can get them to a much smaller form factor. And this is gonna let us move forward to actually like back drive these motors um, and give the user the, an idea of like a true haptic feedback and make them feel like they're really in that situation. So that's where we're going on this year. I think end of this year, our goal is backdrive the, um, the exoskeleton to give the user that true like haptic feedback. I just have to say that the fish demo and haptic feedback together just boggles my mind. <laughs> I can't imagine really feeling fish, not that you're doing that, but uh, it, it was something I'd never thought about um, how something could uh, handle a, an object that has such strange texture. <laughs> well, I also really appreciated the quote unquote, high speed seafood handling as a <laughs> scenario. So I think that maybe there's there's more of a future there as fishing is a big industry and I understand in the Northeast. Um, what, so you mentioned, you talked about shaving as an, as an ultimate task for the use case of this avatar. I'm curious, um, maybe Albert or Mike or Anya, if there are other use cases that are sort of inspired um, your development or the way that you've applied your knowledge to this challenge. Um, maybe I'll go to Anya if there's any thoughts that you have on you know, what, what's a use case of that, that, that really has driven the work that you've done. Um, I don't know if anyone else has yeah, anything specific in mind. I can jump in if you want. Yeah, go ahead, Michael. Well, I think once, well, uh, in terms of very specifics, I think the obvious one that jumps to a lot of people's mind is surgery. Um, there's only so many high-level surgeons in this world, and obviously, you know, travel being a thing is um, limits the access of care for a lot of people. So, if you can get a telepresencing robot to the accuracy and responsiveness needed for some kind of complicated surgery, that could save a lot of people's lives. Um, and additionally, there's also like search and rescue situations, anything where the human life would normally be in danger and you require a human level of interactivity, those things need to be done through telepresence thing in the future. And so I don't know if that's specific enough, but that's sort of the things that drive us and where, why we're doing this. And um, I think just to add to that, Mike, um, 
for me at least, uh, the public school system has been um, instrumental in getting me to where I am and, and, and proceeding to where I'm going. And I think that uh, in the current state of affairs, a lot of schools being shut down and things like that, people are looking for a solution as to how teachers are going to interact and, and successfully teach their students and how coaches are going to interact and successfully teach and coach their athletes. And I think that this avatar system, um, if, if worked on and done correctly, could really be um, instrumental and, and being the solution there. Imagine students um, being in a classroom or uh, like separated in different classrooms. And instead of having much teachers having to come in, you could have uh, robotic coaches, maybe in every single home. Um, just the, the, the opportunities are endless. So, yeah. I had, uh, I had one last thing to add um, following on what, what Albert said. And, and it reminded me of something Jackie said earlier about the emotional connection. You know, even if all you have is sort of the um, you know, two eyes and a, and a, and a pen and a, and, a, and a tilt and a yaw, um, you, you're sort of able, able to get kind of an emotional connection. Um, I have a, a very short video. Um, if there's um, time here, I'm gonna try to share my screen. This is actually a, a, a clip. This is from um, back in Disney days, but this is, this is actually trying to focus on that emotional connection um, as, as sort of the, 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 the primary focus. <laughs> in a robotic system. So I think it, it actually doesn't take a it, it doesn't take a, a a really human mimetic system to necessarily uh, be able to convey a lot of emotion. And so, one of the things that um, you know interested me at Disney and that and that interests um, me about Avatar is is the ability to have an enhanced emotional connection with someone. You know, in in ways that just with a sort of a flat screen and no physical interaction is is missing. And I think that you know you don't need a sort of future level technology to actually get there. I think that um, there's really interesting things that can be done with, with today's technology. Yeah, it's just the eyes and the, and the mouth and the tilt of the head and the movements. It's, it, we don't really care what your skin looks like. <laughs> mm -hmm. There's something subtle too about even the, the color of the, the nubs at the end of the end effectors that kind of gives it some brightness as well. And then even just a little bit of that fluid motion of waving, beckoning, saying hello is, is definitely a way to convey some emotional connection. Uh, even though it would, it's really just a, a mechanical being right in front of you. Yeah, appreciate you that. It's a really great uh, tie in to connection, especially to what Albert mentioned about having a, having or conveying presence in a way that doesn't um, doesn't limit the experience that that maybe students would have, teachers would have, and really important roles that require connections. We are just coming over the time. Um, if viewers wanted to learn more about the work that you're doing, uh, whether it's related to the Avatar X Prize or just at the Institute for Experiential Robotics, where could they go? Is there the best website? Any more videos that they might be able to see about your work? Um. Yeah, I, I would say um, searching the uh, news archives on Northeastern's website. Um, there are several stories about uh, uh, past projects that are uh, related to this work. And uh, yeah, I think that's, that's a, good, uh, a good place to go. Yeah, the, the Institute itself is actually just being stood up. So I don't know that we have a, um, a fancy website that has a, a, an archive of, of all of the um, projects uh, related to affiliated faculty, um, mm -hmm. but uh, we're working on it. Great. Yeah, we'll look forward to when that's uh, standing tall with more work about the Avatar X Prize and more to come from, from your team as you continue to develop your work. So I want to thank you all. We are out of time for today's session. I appreciate everybody taking the time to join the session, whether you were a panelist or an attendee or viewing the recording later on. Thanks for jumping in. So on behalf of the Avatar X Prize, we really appreciate um, having Tashkin, Peter, Carl, Albert, Anya, and Michael, as well as thanking all the other members of Team Northeastern for your contributions to the team and your hard work on the Avatar X Prize. Um, it has really been a pleasure to speak with you today, 
hearing more about your approach to the competition and learning how all of your studies and work are coming together to integrate into this challenge. So everyone, this has been the fifth in a series of Meet the Teams webinar interviews. You can view the previous Meet the Team sessions and other innovation-driven content by visiting XPRIZE's YouTube channel. Um, if you have questions about the Avatar XPRIZE or you may want to have questions more for uh, Team Northeastern, you can email us at avatar at xprize.org. And you can visit avatar.xprize.org for more information about our competition and to see the full list of qualified teams. So we are wishing you well from Los Angeles and hope you're staying safe and healthy. And I hope you enjoy the rest of your mornings, afternoons, and your evenings. Take care.